Wow, welcome everyone. Hello. I am uh, Rosaria Pisa. I'm the Director of Gender and Women's Studies. And this is um, just uh, beautiful to see. Uh, so many of you came out for our um, wonderful and very valued uh, colleague, Dr. Jody Lisberger, um, who many of you uh, know as um, <laughs> as a colleague, but as a faculty, as your faculty, and you are aware of what a dynamo she is and what a ball of fire and energy she is. <laughs> uh, Jody, we're so grateful that you are part of our team and we so much value all you do to inspire all of us and especially the students here. Truly, thank you. Welcome to the Dana Sugar um, Gender and Women's Studies lecture. Uh, we give uh, one or two of these every semester to showcase um, the, the scholarly talent here at URI um, and um, an opportunity for, um, for, to contribute to the community and uh, support uh, dialogue around very important salient issues in uh, gender and women's studies. Um, so I know that Jody has a lot to share with you today, so I'm not going to take up a lot of time with comments. I would just want to introduce, do a good job of introducing her here. Um, so Dr. Lisberger is an associate professor in general women's studies. She was originally trained as an anthropologist and did a study of an ancient chicken market in bourgeon bresse Bourgogne Press, I should have asked you before, uh, in uh, France. She has a PhD in English with a specialty in feminist narrative theory, problems of sacrifice, and alternative notions of narrative desire. Her previous research has been on the politics of data gender bias and border, border mentality in the EEOC, uh, De and Du Foucault. Is that also French, Jody? No, DES. DES. Di Foucault. Okay. Pharmaceutical marketing choices, why women should take heed. The university as nation state, transnational remedies. Challenging the myth of disposable women, and disposable women, border mentalities, and militarization in academia. She also worked as an editor, grant writer, and journalist, including for Sojourner, the feminist newspaper that in its heyday went to 40,000 readers worldwide. She wrote articles about acupuncture and menopause, medical abortions, health education in the wake of the Jocelyn Elders firing, and the 1994 Pensacola abortion clinic shooting. She also has an MFA in fiction writing and has several stories published in notable literary journals and a 2008 short story collection, Remember Love, which was nominated for a National Book Award. Please um, help me welcome Dr. Jody Lisberger to the podium. There you go. Whoa, I did not realize that nuclear waste was such a popular topic. <laughs> Thanks, Rosaria. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Welcome to my talk on ecology, gender, and nuclear waste, the perils of not knowing about Hanford, the largest nuclear waste site in the US. My goal today is fourfold. First, to tell you about Hanford and show you some pictures so Hanford is no longer a mystery to you. Second, to share with you the surprises and cracked open controversy that met me last June for the first time in my life, I spent 10 days at Hanford attending Department of Energy and Hanford Advisory Board hearings, touring with the Yakima Nation and boating on the Columbia River to see Hanford from the water. 
Visiting the plutonium production sites and gazing across its vast shrub step terrain, interviewing many people and spending time in Richland, the city immediately to the south of Hanford, where the elite, white, and highly educated people who worked at Hanford lived rent free. Third, I want to share research that exposes in more depth the ecology and gender perils connected to Hanford in its role in determining and normalizing the nuclear landscape, the nuclear state, and the nuclear body. Finally, I want to contemplate the deeper issues of how ecology, gender, citizenship, and militarization need to be seen as not as separate issues, but as deeply connected to each other and to the normalized nuclear landscape, body, and state. My examination of Hanford from the surface to the depths is in a way a perfect mirror of, for Hanford, which, in which the contrast between what we can see on the surface and what we cannot see deep underground or behind governmental privatized and hegemonic institutional practices is deeply troubling. First, I want to thank Mike, my partner, for designing my poster, encouraging me to go to Hanford, and honoring my work in person in a million ways. I want to thank URI's Research and Economic Development Office, Jen Riley from the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and Gender and Women's Studies for funding my trip. I want to thank my TA and student, Elijah Benton, for helping me with my bibliography, and our videographer, James Zhang. My colleagues, friends, Hanford colleagues and students, of course, I most want to thank you for being here, though admittedly some of my students were coerced. One of the very special things about URI, I like to believe, is the way faculty and students reach out to share support and learn from each other. I'm hoping that someone will give these two people their seat. Oh, there are two seats right here. You can go right behind the aisles. Thank you. As I begin, I want to tell you that the seed and potential end result of my research is personal. In the fall of 1948 and sporadically in 1949, my father, an electrical engineer and manager for General Electric, worked at Hanford. In 1961, I was eight, he died of a metastasized colon cancer. My mother lived with my father as a newlywed in Richland in 1948. When she died in 2007, I also found a folder that informed me of the extent of the blood cancer she had and of the class action suit against GE that she'd been part of in the early 1990s. This suit futilely sought compensation for GE's cover-ups about long-term cancer effects of radiation at and around Hanford. These facts opened up for me a set of research questions I am hoping to answer, both to contribute to political and academic conversations about ecology, gender, and nuclear waste, and also to figure out what my second novel will be about. I come at this project with the eye of a scholar and also a fiction writer, so perhaps I see different things. Mostly, I'm looking for deep conflicts and characters involved in this nuclear waste crisis today. In any case, these are my guiding questions. One, what did my father really do at Hanford? And why don't I, didn't I know? I've always wanted to believe that as a pioneer in industrial labor relations and as someone who was teaching managers how to work better with workers, my father was striving to help protect the workers at Hanford. Having now studied GEs and the Atomic Energy Commissions and the state of Washington's efforts to shut down labor unions, I hate to admit that my hope is untrue. Why, in 1961 or even 1971, hadn't people explored and confirmed the connections between radiation and cancer? In short, why wasn't my father being honored on Veterans Day? Third, and finally, why don't more people know about Hanford? What are the perils of their ignorance? I use the word perils deliberately here instead of risks because risks tend to be seen as rational choices we contemplate and engage with, while perils are things that often lurk unbeknownst to us beyond our reason or culpability. So first, let me share with you my PowerPoint that shows you some of what Hanford looks like. This as my warning. 
Hanford, for those of you who are not aware, is in the state of Washington. You can see it here, right where the Columbia and Yakima and Snake Rivers come together. It is uh, a large area, 586 square miles, that the tour guides say, and I had to chuckle about this, is about half the size of Rhode Island. It was taken over by the US government in 1943 as part of the Manhattan Project and run initially by DuPont and GE, that's General Electric. Natives, farmers, ranchers were evicted. Uh, the town of White Bluffs was moved. And this is where the plutonium for the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was made. Hanford was built and made bomb ready in 11 months by the work of 40,000 people. So Richland, this is my flight in. I want to give you a sense of the terrain because part of a novelist's quest is to go and to see. And so this is from the airplane. This is actually Kennewick, which is one of the towns that black people uh, and Mexican people, actually the Mexican people lived in Pasco because they were not allowed to live in Hanford. Um, this is the street that I rented my Airbnb on. And this is the house, the beige house. These are known as alphabet houses. And at the time, um, DuPont and then GE built these houses so that people who worked at Hanford would have a marvelous place to live. And they're all similar. So you see the neighborhoods filled with houses that look like this. And it was just by coincidence that my Airbnb put me in one. Here's the Columbia River. As I will say later, I was shocked to see that people were swimming in the river because my understanding was that there's a radioactive site right up river. But there they were swimming with a gorgeous bike path. There's a very funny kind of downtown that reminded me of the Emporium, bizarre in its construction, about a block long that was built to allow people who lived in Richland not to have to use their cars, but to be able to walk and go to restaurants and things like that. And it, it's still there. It's about a block long, uh, an emporium taken away. This is, uh, there's a bike path that runs all the way along the Columbia River. This is a hotel. And you can see in the far distance Rattlesnake Mountain, which is a very important place for the Native Americans who were thrown off the land. Um, a place where their youth often went for various initiation rites. Here I am, of course, you saw me on the poster. I, I love to be outdoors, and it was a beautiful, beautiful June week that I was there. I did not expect, at the end of my eight-mile rented bike ride, to come to a memorial for a war submarine. But this is the mentality of Richland and Hanford, still very, very proud. This is the high school teams that are known as the bombers that have atomic clouds on their helmets. So I was very surprised, and I might just leave us thinking here. This was the sign, the fence. And the other thing I would have you notice is in the back, very back of this photo, you can see some industrial pipes. That's actually the beginning of Hanford that would have been defined behind the barrier. So, so proximate to where people are living is the beginning of that zone that was taken over for um, production of plutonium. So I want to first start by setting you up with an understanding of why is Hanford such a mess, because this video can explain better than I can. Um, as I said, this why you all came. Gallons. And this is nuclear waste. And this is 56 million gallons of nuclear waste. It's toxic, radioactive, and is sitting in old leaky tanks just a few hours upriver from the port. <coughs> it's here at Hanford, where all that waste is polluting groundwater, which is seeping toward the Columbia River. And after more than 20 years and $19 billion spent, None of it has been treated. For decades, Hanford was America's plutonium factory. It was one of the original Manhattan Project sites supplying the radioactive material at the heart of America's nuclear arsenal. Over the course of Hanford's military lifetime, it was home to nine nuclear reactors used to irradiate uranium fuel rods, creating plutonium. That plutonium was then extracted with chemicals, processed, and shipped off to weapons factories. Each step of that process produced radioactive waste, some of it liquid, some of it solid, some of it somewhere in between. 
For decades, workers poured much of the liquid waste, hundreds of billions of gallons worth, into the ground. They dumped the rest, including solids and sludges, into underground tanks to be dealt with later. And now, it's later. A patch of contaminated groundwater the size of Seattle lies under the site, those old tanks are deteriorating, and the official plan to clean it all up has serious problems. The basic idea is to pump up and treat the groundwater, get the waste out of the tanks, and process it into glass log. The first big problem is that radioactive waste can generate flammable gases, which can build up in the tanks and treatment facilities, and if ignited, on top of that, some of the waste in the tanks still contains plutonium, which is heavy. And as the waste is moved around, the plutonium can settle out, bump together, and start an uncontrolled chain reaction. That might not be such a big deal if workers could monitor and step in to prevent the accident, but the treatment process, at least for the most hazardous waste, has to happen in special rooms, called black cells, that are too radioactive for humans to enter. According to the official plan, the machinery in those black cells has to work smoothly for 40 years with no direct human intervention. If something goes wrong, there would be little workers could do to prevent hazardous waste from spreading around the site. But the cleanup has made some progress. The liquid waste in the oldest, leakiest tanks was transferred to newer tanks. And in 2015, workers treated 2 billion gallons of groundwater. But the vast majority of contaminated groundwater is still there, and they haven't even started treating the actual waste in the tanks. In fact, they haven't even finished building the treatment plants. Construction was supposed to be done by 2007. That slipped to 2011, and then 2019, and recently the deadline was extended again to 2036 for the most waste. Humans have never cleaned up a mess quite like the waste at hand. And after years of delays, we don't know if the current plan will be up to the task. That means that without some breakthrough technology or a new plan, those 56 million gallons of nuclear waste will likely continue to sit just hours of river from Portland. All right. Um. So I suspect, first I have to tell you that this little video was obviously made by an environmentalist who's concerned about Hanford because there are people, as I will go on to say, who are on both sides of the issue. Um, and that the Department of Energy's Hanford video is worth looking at, but it's 15 minutes long. It will give you a different picture of how propaganda works one way or another. I suspect this film was made in 2016 because there have been more improvement made, though there are still colossal problems. This is what Hanford would look like now. Um, they're working 24-7. Uh, one of the, these are the hazmat suits that people who are working near contaminated areas are wearing, though one of the big things they're working on is trying to get these hazmat suits to fit women better. And it was a long time before they figured out how to give, an, give a different air filtration system that would be good for women as well as men. This led me to be very interested and intrigued when I learned that for years and still, for the people who wear double, double, hazmat suits, that every day after they've been monitored to make sure that they don't have radioactivity on them because they have to make sure they stay under a personal limit for the year so that they will be safe, they take off all of their double hazmat suits and they're buried on site. This is about 1,000 hazmat suits a day times 365 times how many years who are, that are buried under the ground as if somehow that's going to deal with the problem. And then I was interested to learn that if you're wearing a single hazmat suit, laundry used to be done on the Hanford site, but it is now done in Richland at this place at a corporation that is run by the United States government. Um, and I was very intrigued here looking that if you look way in the back near where it says laundry, you will see once again Rattlesnake Mountain, which for a novelist seemed like a pretty powerful thing. So I wanted to um, share a couple of other crucial things that you might want to know about Hanford, just in terms of its history and what 
happened in terms of dispossession of people. There was a treaty in 1855 that originally ceded this land to the Yakima Nation, the Nez Perce tribe, and the Confederated tribes of the Amatilla Indian Reservation. It guaranteed them this land in perpetuity for hunting, fishing, gathering foods, and traditional medicines. Uh, in 1970, for those of you who aren't aware, Nixon established the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to research, monitor, set standards, and enforce environmental protection. The Superfund Act of 1980, which is actually known, most of us don't realize, is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Uh, charged the Department of Energy with preventing or overseeing responsible parties who work to prevent excessive threat to humans for the next 10,000 years. Of course, you have to remember that plutonium has a long, long half-life. In 1987, the last reactor of nine was shut down. No more plutonium was produced. Since then, all of the reactors have been cocooned. That's literally what they look like, except for the B reactor, which is where the plutonium was originally made. It was shut down in 1968. It is now a site for the National Park Service tours. Uh, in October of 1989, Hanford was designated as a Superfund site under a new triparty agreement in which the United States Department of Energy, the DOE, the EPA, and the Washington State Department of Ecology entered into a legally binding agreement to work to clean up the site. Unfortunately, it hasn't been easy. You need to know that clean does not necessarily mean uncontaminated, but rather that space becomes safely inhabitable. And the EPA determined that the means, this means that when only one in 10,000 people die from radiation exposure, it's inhabitable. In 2000, President Bill Clinton decreed that Hanford would no longer have the tag of a nuclear production zone, but would now be called the Hanford Reach National Monument to, in his own words, to protect this unique and biologically diverse landscape. Last, in the year 2000, Congress also passed the EEOICPA, the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. This is for federal workers to get compensation for nuclear production injuries. It has paid out over 66,000 compensation cases, but the process is very cumbersome, the paperwork difficult to get through with all sorts of snags, especially if someone dies in the process. And if you're dead, there's no compensation. So a couple of my surprises when I visited Hanford, I bought bottled water. Everybody said the water was fine to drink. I bought bottled water. I worried about earthquakes. It's on a major earthquake fault. The um, structures at Hanford were not built for earthquake compliance, but nobody else seemed to worry about that. Uh, in one of the Department of Energy meetings, I met a very high level uh, female hydrologist who works with the Department of Ecology, whose daughter had leukemia when she was five, and she whispered to me, she doesn't drink the water. People swam in the river. Um, I didn't realize in terms of downtown and Richland that the same rhetoric was being used when I was there, we want this to be a great town to live in that was being used in 1940, a kind of nostalgia that worries me. HAB, the board that I worked with, the Hanford Advisory Board, at first seemed intensely collaborative. Their rules were marvelous, be courteous, listen, respect your colleagues, um, but more and more, and these were their worries that they had that I will be coming back to. But the more I came to know them, the more I could see how, how much disagreement there was, especially about a group called the Downwinders, which are people who live in Walla Walla and Spokane who are trying to argue their case that several of the radioactive emissions that came from Hanford at crucial places blew uncontrollably over them, and they are now facing injuries as a result. Um, a couple of other points of things that surprised me in one of my interviews, when I talked with the husband of a big, of a, Richland City Council person. He was He also works for the Department of Energy. He was adamant that dilution 
solves the problem. That is, when you put radioactive nuclear waste into a beautiful, huge, multi-volume river like the Columbia, no problem. Or if you put the smokestack high enough, no problem. He also said, interestingly enough, that he thought smokers created their own risk that one of the things, everybody smoked in 1940, a lot of people, a lot of these people got cancer, and unfortunately when you do smoke, your lungs are compromised and you are more susceptible to radioactive uh, impairment. The other shocking thing to me was this person's wife um, told me to be very careful about not talking or trusting Tom Carpenter, who is one of the major litigators for an organization out of Seattle called Hanford Challenge. He would love to have you working for him if you'd like to be out there doing an internship. And I was surprised with the virulence of her not talking to him, that he just wanted to make money. Another interesting facet for me is when I was in the hearings, the DOE people often referred to what I would have said are colossal accidents as incidents, that these moments of radioactive release are called incidents. And when I brought it up in the meetings, and I, because being who I am, and I said, isn't that kind of an odd term? You're treating it as if it was very mundane, simple, not a big issue. And they, were, they sort of blushed a little bit, but they said, well, this is what they had to call it in order that they could kind of control it, be rational about it, and do something about it. I didn't know when I took my tours until afterwards that all the tour guides had radio meters, that they are checking the radioactivity several times a day to make sure that people like me going to visit are not going to be exposed. Um, and the last thing is, I wasn't exposed until the last day that I was there to the wind's ferocity. So one of the issues in Hanford and Richland and the Tri-City areas um, is that the wind is ferocious. Um, it blew into people's houses. These houses were not well made. It blew multi-currents in swirls in ways I'll share with you in a bit. So now that I've done extensive research, what are some of my other... Um, surprises and alarms. Starting with my first question, what did my father really do at Hanford and why don't I know? So the extent, um, so this is ironically where I was in my meetings with the Hanford Advisory Board was also as it ended out up the hotel where my father and mother lived in 1940. I was surprised by that. So I want to move into talking a little bit about ruin and redemption, this idea that you can take, and I am especially showing photographs, thanks to my phone, um, where you see the desiccation of the old tree up against the electrical lines that are running there. This is the haunting of the old Hanford. This is what it looks like now. This is what the construction camp looked like, the fourth largest city in Washington state in 1944. This is the boat that used to go across to White Bluffs, and this is what it looks like now. Um, and so what I'm really wanting to sort of focus on and talk about is the paradox of, this is a pelican. While I was on the boat, I saw a bald eagle. But this is also your entry point into seeing where the water was pumped in and out of the river to go to a little bit farther in the back, the nuclear reactor. Here's a coyote. Um, here are nesting birds. We're getting closer here, closer. And I'm looking for something that I'm not finding, so I'm going to leave it alone. The extent and collusion of top secrecy in the name of patriotism is impressive. Kate Brown in Plutopia and others argue that unwitting ignorance and patriotism blinded people because of the war effort and fears of Soviet attack, and that ignoring the ignoring of radiation harm was not a big deal in the face of other looming issues. I'm less inclined to believe that, ish, that position. Brown herself, along with many other researchers, documents the attempted partitioning of territory into nuclear and safe zones, the skimping on safety and waste management to prioritize production, the repressing of information about accidents, the forging of safety records, and the deploying temporary jumpers to do dirty work, all while glossing over sick workers. She, along with many others, also documents 
documents with extraordinary detail the surveilling of workers and citizens living in adjacent Richland and the harassment of whistleblowers, all actions I cannot deem as innocent or ignorant. The top secrecy played out in the working conditions that you would see. This is the radioactive plant here. Interesting, this is nuclear, the B reactor where plutonium was made. The contrast with the American flag, of course, struck me. This is what the reactor looks like. This is where the person who controlled the reactor sits. Um, it's difficult to make appropriate plutonium because it's, it's actually hard to get at. Here are the people behind it. This is what nuclear waste is put into these trains and sometimes traveled at great distance. Here is what the people were wearing back in the 1940s. They did wear dosimeters. They look kind of archaic. Some of you are young enough not to realize that drinking water would have been in a barrel like this. Interestingly, it was, we were told how to fill it and it was used as a commode, which is otherwise known as a toilet afterwards. Um, I was intrigued that this was the decontamination kit that people were given. It doesn't look very substantial to me. Um, and also that children were frequently tested for thyroid cancers um, in their schools and every day. So here's where I'm at, patriotism, safety, and secrecy. This is a big head of Hitler. Several of these hung in the plant as a warning to people not to talk. Top secret. People on two sides of the reactor didn't know what others were doing, and only 1% of a workforce of 1,000 knew they were making explosive devices. It is said that the military intelligence relied especially on women for their gossiping to get the scoop about other people. In addition, the separation of workforce on site and off, the racial and class hierarchies, black workers hired, lived in separate barracks, dining halls, they paid less, they were paid less. Mexican workers lived in Pasco, so DuPont didn't have to build more barracks, and both Mexicans and black people were not trusted with secret information. The plant's pollution was also kept secret, supposedly because military and corporate leaders didn't want Soviets tipped off onto how much plutonium was being produced. The propaganda was that Hanford was as safe as mother's milk. Uh, it's a strong irony since, of course, they knew, but they weren't telling us, that mother's and cow's milk was often found to be laced with iodine. Now, there's another reason why I wouldn't have known why, what my father did. Um, this is part of the patriotism, patriotism. I need you on the job. A celebration every year to honor Richland, their patriotism. I spent two days reading General Electric newspapers in the Hanford History Project. You can see these cartoons. This one, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, good working conditions. This one talking about what kind of work do you folks do at Hanford Works? Ask us no questions and we'll tell no spies. It was also applied to women, the great talkers apparently. Naturally, if you can't talk about your job, you can't write about it as well. Here's one that really crosses Boy, I'm going to wish for a handsome man with a fine new car. That's a good idea, but I'm going to include a wish for continued observance of security at Hanford Works. So I think one of the things that we find here is intense secrecy uh, and patriotism mixed within the Hanford plant itself. But we also have um, the other reason I wouldn't have known what my father did. <coughs> and Joseph Masco is really the big writer on this, is the invention of the atom bomb utter, was utterly transformative. It turned, he says, the nuclear family into the nuclearized family. The home became the discursive site of Cold War struggles. <clears throat> he proposes that there was a new social contract based not on the protection and improvement of everyday life, but on the national contemplation and containment of the fear about nuclear war in the form of civil defense. So some of us here are old enough to remember the civil defense drills. This was a propaganda campaign that was the largest domestic campaign to date in US history. What was the goal? The goal of it 
was to build strength of the nation and citizenship through the threat of nuclear war, which meant first calibrating public perceptions of nuclear threat and then training citizens to take command over the possibility of war. So in 1953, Val Peterson, who was head of the US Civil Defense Administration said, like a bomb, panic is fissionable. Interesting metaphor. The goal, we needed to train US citizens not to panic. There were town meetings, education programs in the schools, mass media, TV, newspapers, radios, churches. Some of you remember going down into the basement. The idea became that not panicking is a sign of good citizenship. Copying, coping, and conquering disaster is good. And in this respect, civil defense colonized everyday life with minute to minute possibility of nuclear war. Americans were taught, in Masco's words, survival is your business. I think about this today when we are so invested in active shooter drills, counter terror watchmanship, climate change. Because one of the things that happens here is the burden of the problem shifts from the government onto the citizens, when it's the laws and what's going on at the center that really need changing. Some of you remember in 1955, Operation Q, 100 million viewers watched as mannequins were destroyed to show potential destruction. There was a testing of appliances and their resilience to nuclear war, especially targeted to women. It emphasized mastering divided gender tasks. Even frozen chicken pot pies were tested to reassure everyone they would still be edible. The big lesson that came through media and through civil defense is that after nuclear attack, the state is absent and it is up to the citizens to provide order, food, and medical care. They were very careful not to release photos from Hiroshima until 1952. There was very controlled taking of photos at the Trinity bomb site in 1945 in Nevada and also at the, Bikini, at the Bikini Atoll and Marshall Islands in 1946 because they wanted to control this image of the mushroom cloud as something that was both marvelous and banal, fetishizing atomic bombs and all nuclear objects, which helped to distance the state from repercussions. So I could go on and talk about this, but what I want to shift to is the downplaying and the cover-ups of nuclear risk and radioactive waste also impacted the, the treatment of proximate ecologies and bodies. A lot of people might not realize how ecology developed hand in hand with the nuclear landscape and, ha and the nuclear state, or how, in Lauren Pitten Pitkinen's words, radioactive substances became geopolitical tools of power. In 1970, in high school, I didn't take physics. I took this new subject, ecology, having no idea how much the development of ecology was tied to the nuclear landscape. Early on, questions about nuclear fallout produced an unprecedented commitment to research in climatology and earth sciences. Radioactive fallout was understood as a tool for tracking ecosystem flows and dynamics. Isotopes were used to trace turnover processes. In the 1940s, Hanover scientists studied the ecology. They monitored vegetation, birds, sheep, cattle, though it, most of this information didn't become public to us till 1965. The Green Run in 1949 was a colossal failure, an attempt to put radioactive waste into the air, done in collaboration with the US Air Force, um, and massive amount of curries ended up being in the air, and they didn't wait for the wind to stop. It came up and blew. Um, whole shadows of toxic clouds over Richland and Kennewick. The whole incident wasn't revealed until 1986, probably because it was in the shadow of Chernobyl. The name of the person charged is class, who was in charge is classified to this day. So the other thing that I want to say is that nuclear safety and remediation starting in the 1990s was put in the hands of what are called radiological control technicians or health physics technicians, HPTs. And they were charged with ensuring that contamination not move beyond controlled areas of the site and thereby enter the uncontaminated world. One HPT, according to Shannon Cram, recalls the, back, the black widow spider 
in a waste tank, or contaminated coyote urine on telephone poles, or atomic tumbleweeds, or radioactive mice, rats, and rabbits with cesium droppings, or wasps building radioactive nests, or elk foraging on irrigated grasses, or in 1998, the very famous fruit fly incident, a source of contamination that spread from leftover food on, in Hanford to an entire garbage site. Cram notes, Hanford's management team leapt into action, struggling to contain the fruit flies and the message. 200 tons of garbage were returned to Hanford and buried at the cost of $2 million. Now, let me pause here to consider why containment or boundary setting and control strategies and rhetorics are at the center of the peril of Hanford and nuclear waste. Scientifically, scientists prided and still, I think, pride themselves on being apolitical. To go political was to cease to have credibility as a detached, objective scientist. But scientific research was used at Hanford for entirely political ends. Furthermore, the assumption of science as an esteemed validating activity also undermines what Elizabeth Hoover in her book, The River is in Us, calls barefoot epidemiology. The belief that people on the ground know best the signals and woes and cures for contamination that situated knowledge is crucial to pay attention to. Um, Health-wise, such rhetoric of containment and control doesn't acknowledge the fact that radioactivity is not a controlled event. It's ambiguous and multi-generational. It has at least a 20-year latency period, and that permissible dose standards are not universal or reliable. Now, permissible dose standards, as they're used today, are derived from Japanese bodies, those willing to report in the post-atom bomb lifespan study their encounters with the bomb and survival. But these accounts don't acknowledge the huge variety of radiation exposures, Japanese's inability to remember details in such shock, uncertainties in dosimetry, and the impossibility of detecting long-term radiation effects or distinguishing them from other cancer mutations. And yet, in 1949, the International Commission on Radiation Protection, the ICRP, <laughs> determined a standardized body called the standard man, later referred to as the reference man, to assess radioactive permissibility. It's still the tool being used, though with slight modifications with the acceptance that such a man leaves out women. But Mr. Reference Man is 20 to 30 years old, weighs 155 pounds, is 5'6", Caucasian, Western European, or North American. The goal was to start with this model and adjust for organs, skin, color, and diet. Then, what was added to Reference Man was breasts, ovaries, <laughs> uterus, and red bone marrow, as if that's what makes a woman a woman, or solves the problem of gender inequality. I suppose this was our first official adult uh, hermaphrodite. What does it ignore? It ignores how radiation exposures differ from contaminant to contaminate, contaminant, and impact different organs in different ways. These dose standards also say nothing about health risks differ according to economic and social disparities and access. For instance, the federal guidance reports never mentions race. The bigger issue is that nuclear standards must make radiogenic injury generalizable so there can be rules and policies, but these in race erase the individual. They also normalize injury as part of the job and fate in modern life and work. Necessary wounding becomes an accepted part of the nuclear modern day landscape and body. The permissible dose regulating also puts the burden of injury and daily monitoring on the workers, not on the management or industry. Workers' obligatory acceptance of the standard for permissible dose is known as ALARA, as low as is reasonably possible, with that word reasonably not sitting well on my tongue. 
For Hanford Native Americans, this rigid notion of what returning to contaminated land, being subjects to assessment and facing permissible dose standards created and creates impossible contradictions, among others, of having to participate in risk assessments, but being subsumed under universal standards. For women, and in the broader application of gender is incorporating race and class, for people who have no choice but to labor at Hanford, such notions of containment or safe exposure also have immense stakes. Reminiscent of the radium girls assigned the radioactive task of painting radium on watches in World War I, women at Hanford were assigned chemical processing jobs. Kate Brown suggests this was maybe because it was cheaper to hire women who were paid less and who did not qualify for housing in Richland, where you had to be married to get housing. Brown reports that DuPont at first didn't want to hire female plant operators of childbearing age, but the Manhattan Project officers feared a labor shortage and so said women should be hired to distill irradiated uranium down to drops of plutonium, which was wrongly considered safer and less complicated than work in the reactors. One woman said she was told the chemicals were dangerous, but there was no mention of radioactivity. Her boss didn't want her wearing gloves, uh, brown reports, because they hindered her working quickly and precisely. In 1944, brown reports that when DuPont again worried about hiring pre menopausal women, the Army Corps officers said they needed to hire women to avoid hiring racial and ethnic minorities. It's true, workers had regular medical surveillance, but doctors had orders, quote, to inform employees of medical abnormalities only if the maladies were not related to radiation. Plus, DuPont and GE had their own doctors and clinics as a way of maintaining control. Even for those women facing radioactivity, they were less likely to be protected because permissible doses for them were based on Mr. Reference Man. And yet studies show that women and children are more vulnerable to nuclear risks than adult men, and that women are also 37.5% more likely than men to develop cancers from the same amount of radiation. <laughs> Environmentally, the rhetoric and public relations cleanup campaigns hinged on containment are also a problem. They create a false and nostalgic bifurcation between then and now, ruin and redemption. Nuclear and toxic waste sites get proposed as protected wilderness areas as if they have been or can be returned to their original pristine state. This upbeat future, Shannon Cram contends, positions the Department of Energy as caretaker of fragile ecosystems, of landscapes returned good as new. I was surprised on my Hanford tours and in Richland to hear guides boast that because the area had been isolated for plutonium production, it now houses extensive and rare species of animals, flora, and fauna. This code switching, Cram calls it, from military to wildlife, warfare to wildlife, bombs to birds, not only erases the damage the state has caused, but rhetorically sets up nuclear waste management as environmental preservation. Ultimately, protecting the Department of Energy from the damages it created, absolving themselves of responsibility or culpability. In my title, I also refer to gender as part of my talk. I want to stress, beyond the treatment of women and minorities, how these modes of containment and boundary setting speak to gender's central critique of hegemonic power dynamics. An investment in binaries and boundaries, global feminists will argue, assumes power exists on only one side of the border, not to be shared. It conceives of resistance as weakness, the opposite of power. It probably positions whistleblowers on the side of weakness uh, and not empowered. It is dependent on a heavy investment in male-female opposition. It perpetuates the naturalization of masculinist and racist values. And as Mohanty argues, it's reactive and regressive. The truth is, the government and contractors have long known about the hazards of nuclear production and waste. 
Tom Carpenter says, people in charge of cleanup have no transparency, no accountability, and that's how they want things. Kate Brown, if you're interested in the extensive use of radioactive isotopes to be tested on people in the 1940s and 50s, goes into it at length in Plutopia. I don't have time to go into it right now. Uh, what I want you to see is between November 2009 and January 2016, about 380 workers have reported vapor-related injuries. But according to Thomas Mueller in his new book, Crisis on Conscience, Whistleblowers in the Age of Fraud, local health officials, many of whom are employed by the contractors, concealed or modified documents to minimize reportables. In 1993, Hazel O'Leary, new Secretary of Energy, finally declared, we're coming clean, the Cold War is over, and the government will admit to cover-ups and huge problems associated with nuclear waste and remediation. Wildlife refuges would reflect one aspect of the new effort. But in coming clean and creating these wildlife refuges, there are also huge benefits to the DOE. For starters, some argue, not allowing people to live on these sites also means the Department of Energy can leave more radioactive waste on site and save money while remaining legally compliant. So I'm almost done. Let me just tell you why saving money is a fallacy. Since the way contracting worked and still works at Hanford, this saving money, this saving money is more about guaranteeing the constant flow of money to contractors from citizen and federal tax dollars than it is an actual savings. Government and contractor secrecy about shortcuts to save money and time to produce more plutonium while Hanford was up and running, short change safety then, and continues to be an issue in the mismanagement and deal making going on to this day between contractors and the federal government as the government has over time teamed up with the nation's largest engineering and construction firms and prime contractors, DuPont, GE, Westinghouse, Rockwell, Fluor, and today Bechdel and Washington River Protection Solutions, which run the tank farms, the policies and backdoor deals that were made years ago continue to be made. Bonus incentives continue to compel contractors to rush work or say something is finished when it's not. Contractors continue to put in bids. Let's see what's happening here. Contractors continue to put in bids, win contracts, and then immediately double, triple, quadruple the price. Changing contractors midstream continues to create transition woes and errors with contractors ignoring or circumventing man management directives and also seeing to it that whistleblowers are forced out the door except for those, yes. I'm not sure what's happening there. We've been foreclosed, the CIA has heard. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Uh, that whistleblowers are forced out the door except for those who choose to remain anonymous for fear of losing their jobs. In terms of lawsuits brought against contractors, contractors hire $1,000 an hour lawyers who are in fact paid by the Department of Energy, which means that taxpayers are in fact paying for litigation that can take years and is already slanted in the contractor's favor. The contracts they get, unlike for shopping centers, are in the millions, they last years, they have zero capital investment, and as Mueller notes, you get to bill the government for overhead, which gives you seed money to go out and bid new jobs. If they get hit with an occasional fine or lawsuit, Miller reports, they just charge it to their shareholders or build it into their unit rates, which you can never see and just steal it back. Despite decades of human harm, waste, fraud, and abuse, Mueller credibly claims Hanford's culture of impunity remains intact because the would-be regulators at the DOE and the EPA, but also at the state and local levels, are part of the game and look silently away as billions roll into the Tri-Cities. Congress holds hearings, shows its outrage, yet Congress continues to send them billions because a goodly portion of those billions are kicked back 
as campaign contributions, votes, or what is known as nuclear pork. Some of it, I now know, also goes to the Washington Department of Ecology and the Office of River Protection, federal offices whose very survival depends on contractors getting their money. The last thing that Mueller says, in February 2017, ostensibly as part of his regulation cutting drive, Trump announced the removal of civil penalties against nuclear contractors who retaliate against whistleblowers. Not a surprising move. So what are Hanford's pressing concerns today? One, on February 11th, 2020, they have decided, to, the DOE has said they are going to reclassify high-level waste as low-level waste. Not a good idea. On February 10th, 2020, the Trump administration proposed again cutting the Hanford budget by about $416 million. On February 3rd, 2020, Japanese officials, we're told, are doing the PR work for the plan to dump Fukushima water into the ocean. January 11th, and I hope this makes you chuckle, 2020, tumble sweet, tumbleweeds went up in flames on Highway 240 near Richland in piles of 20 to 30 feet high. The highway was closed for 10 hours. Snow plows were used to remove the tumbleweeds, the innocent tumbleweeds, which become radioactive when they suck up groundwater, spin out radioactive seeds, which jackrabbits love and coyotes love and kids used to chase and play with when they blew into <coughs> Richland, Pasco, and Kennewick. The state has recently fined Hanford $100 million for withholding critical safety information. In December 2019, a Hanford contractor earned a $39 million incentive bonus. Most pressing is the waste treatment plant that won't be built for ages, is, if ever. At the same time, Trump is allowing mining waste to be dumped into waterways and destroying the EPA. Will things change if we realize the perils of Hanford in all its looming meanings? In the end, I don't know. If we'll be able to change the fact that in Gabriel Heck's words, technology seems merely a tool of politics but it is rather a mode of politics. I don't know if in Lauren Pitkinen's words, we'll be able to change the fact that privatization works as a means to separate the state from the truth of what it's actually encouraging and benefiting from. I don't know in Eric Loomis's words, if we'll be able to take the nostalgia, the most politically reactionary of all human emotions in one of the elements of white nationalism out of the nuclear landscape nor do I know if finally Shannon Cram's words will ever be able, in Shannon Cram's words, will ever be able to structure and implement nuclear cleanup on a new basis that recognizes that material and spaces are not fixed or containable, but fluid and changing, even contradictory. What I do believe, as Pittigan and Farish assert, is that to merely see the US nuclear wasteland is a political act. Perhaps this act of seeing today can help us not be deterred by barriers to inquiry, which they and others assert are devices for the reproduction of state authority and identity. Perhaps it can encourage us to probe boundaries in the infrastructure of state secrecy, resist temptation to revel in narratives of national achievement about the bomb, resist turning toxicity into marvel or banality, and realize how the modes of geopolitical exploitation and nuclear normalization are entrenched and worthy of challenging in the very essence of empire. Thank you.